My name is Ahmed Kuru, Professor of Political Science at San Diego State University, and I am also the author of Islam, Authoritarianism and Underdevelopment, a Global and Historical Comparison, published by Cambridge University Press last year. I'm thankful to Javad Hairania for his recent Tehran Times interview with me about my book, and also his kind invitation to this video interview to summarize the arguments of my book. I'm very happy that my book is now being translated to Farsi by Mehri publication, because Iran has been very important for the Muslim intellectual life from history to present and historically in early Islamic history it produced many important philosophers. And my book is also being translated to Arabic, Bosnian and Indonesian languages as well. So the question in the book is very contemporary. It's about the Muslim world, 49 Muslim majority countries. Why do we see a substantial level of authoritarianism and also very low level of socioeconomic development in the Muslim world, not only in comparison to Western countries, but also in comparison to world averages. And this question becomes even more puzzling when we know about the early Muslim achievements from 8 to 12 centuries, especially 9 to 11 centuries. Muslims were ahead of Europeans in terms of philosophy and science, as well as economic development. Muslim had large libraries with hundreds of thousands of books, whereas Europeans had libraries with less than 600 books. Muslims learned to produce paper in the eighth century from China. And then it took five centuries for Europeans to learn it from European Muslims and try to produce paper in Europe itself. So what explain the early Muslim achievements and contemporary problems in the Muslim world? There are two arguments in not only social scientific literature, but also in daily life people are discussing and talking about. One is singling out Islam, that Islam is source of problems. Throughout my book, I show the weaknesses of this argument. Because in early Islamic history, Islam and development was, they were perfectly compatible. There was no problem between Islam and progress. The second argument is positioning, noting Western imperialism, that Western colonization made the decline in the Muslim world. So this argument has also many problems as I show in my book. One major problem is that when the Western colonization began in the 18th and 19th centuries, Muslim already had substantial scientific and economic problems. Therefore, colonization didn't create problems. It reproduced them, increased the level, but it's not the main cause. The main cause is domestic. Let me explain. It's basically the relationship between four classes. Economic class, intellectual class, political class, and religious class. In early Islamic history, the Muslim scholars were mostly independent from political authorities. From the 8th to mid 11th century, According to one analysis, out of 4,000 scholars, only 9% were state servants, functioning, working in courthouses, etc. But 91 were funded privately. They were merchants or members of merchant families and having other professions. This was because of the fact that major ulama, major Islamic scholars, put a distance between themselves and state authorities like Abu Hanifa, Ibn Hanbal, Jafar, and Sadiq. And their reasoning was based on the idea that Umayyads persecuted Prophet's family members, including uh, Hussein and Ali and others, and 
this was really a reason for the ulama to be distant from political rulers regarding them corrupt. And at that time, the merchants and intellectuals were supporting each other between the 8th to mid 11th centuries. And during this period, Western Europe was dominated by the clergy and the military aristocracy. But later on, the two regions change. Muslims end up with an ulema state alliance, a partnership between religious and political authorities, starting with the mid 11th century because of economic transformation from the monetary economy to state controlled ikhtar system and militarization of state structure by the Ghaznavi and Selçuk, the Turkish nomadic empires or states and the religious transformation in the 11th century. Abbasi caliphs at that time, Sunni caliphs and even Hanbali they regarded the rise of Shia dynasties as a threat. Fatimis in Egypt, Karmatis in Arabian Peninsula, Hamdanis in Syria, Buyids in Iraq. And the Abbasi caliphs called all the Sunni sultans, ulama, and masses to be unified. In order to do that, these caliphs declare a Sunni Orthodox creed, which declare certain Shias, Mu'tazila scholars and philosophers, apostates who could be punished by death. So the Seljuk Empire institutionalizes Sunni orthodoxy by establishing series of madrasas called the Nizamiya madrasas. And in this neo system after the mid 11th century, merchants were marginalized. The ties between merchants and ulema was cut. The ulama needed funding and it was fulfilled by the government, state treasury and the Nizamiya Madrasa system. And that's the basis of ulama state alliance, which marginalized Muslim intellectuals and scholars, philosophers, as well as economic entrepreneurs. Then came the Mongol and Crusader invasions. For some scholars, Mongols and Crusaders are the main reason for the decline. And I said, no, because the Mongols and Crusaders are important in a sense that they support Ulema state alliance. Because when people saw the massacres by Mongols and Crusaders, they sought help from the military heroes like Saladin. They more uh, likely to become followers of Sufi Sheikh the ulema with religious teaching to make meaning to these massacres. And after the Mongol and Crusader invasions, Muslims recovered politically. They established empires, Ottoman, Safavi, Mughal empires, but they never recover intellectually, never produce scholars like Ibn Sina once again. Meanwhile, in Europe, things change in a different opposite direction. With city-states, Europeans produce a new intellectual uh, bourgeois class with new ins uh, institutions such as universities, Europe produced a new intellectual class. And these bourgeois and intellectual classes led to Renaissance, Reformation, Printing Revolution, Scientific Revolution, Enlightenment, and political revolutions. Whereas the Muslim world was stuck with military empires, ulema state alliance, and disregard European innovations such as printing press. And it took three centuries for Muslims to adopt printing press and publish books. And the result is that in the early 19th century, the average literacy rate in the Ottoman Empire was as low as 1%. At a time when Europeans had more than 30% average literacy rate. So the class relations therefore explain the rise of the West, the decline of the Muslim world. Many reformers in the Muslim world realized the problem from Kemal of Turkey, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, to Jamal of Egypt, Jamal Abdel Nasser. They try to sideline the ulema and make reforms in a European manner. But 
it didn't work because these reformists were mostly military leaders. They didn't understand the importance of intellectual class. They didn't understand the importance of independent bourgeois class. They tried to reform the Muslim world with top down military style bureaucratic reforms, which didn't work. And it came to today that in many Muslim majority countries, there are ulema state alliances funded by oil money and intellectual life and economic life are mostly stagnant. So let me conclude by two policy recommendations. In order to revive their economic and intellectual life, Muslims really need an independent and dynamic intellectual class, an independent and dynamic bourgeois class. And the second policy recommendation I would say is that Muslims really do not need to imitate Western models. They have their own historical models. If they analyze the period between eighth to 12th century, how there was diversity, multiple philosophical views, religious interpretations, coexistence of different religions and philosophies, and dynamism economically and scientifically, the Muslims really can have a renaissance today by taking their early historical experience as the model. Thanks for listening and have a wonderful one.